It's like late 2000s house music. <laughs> I like how this song sounds. Mm. All right, so welcome to another episode of Much Ado About Economics, and dun, dun, today dun, we're going to be <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about um, universities and specifically the Ivy League. So we're going to sort of we're going to look at this. Um, I guess the best word to call it is stigma behind mm-hmm. going to an Ivy League university, but also we're going to discuss the whole, in a way, the economics behind it, right? Like, what mm-hmm. benefit does it actually give you? Mm-hmm. Like a pros and cons. So. Um, and starting off first, Ivy League universities are very high in demand. Everybody wants to get into them, yeah. right? But in a way, because it's so hard to get into them, it's like having a price ceiling. Mm. There's a huge demand. There's not enough supply of education. So that creates a shortage. And to be able to meet that shortage, yeah. it includes your willingness to pay. So the amount you're actually going to pay for your education and meeting a bunch of other criteria like grade points, SAT scores, extracurriculars, extracurriculars, the way you write your common app essays. Yeah. And also a lot of the times they look at like your kindergarten, your elementary. Yeah. So it starts from the moment you enter into school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and um, connections too connections definitely like they look at your family history right mm. like where your families come from your legacy exactly yeah right so so you will see like a lot of um top bureaucrats in let's say let's talk about the u.s right if they went to harvard you will notice a trend that their family will also go to harvard yeah and yeah that's because they also like they give you a, a discount Mm-hmm. Like you know, like a friends and family discount, a family discount, so like, like an alumni discount, alumni discount, and right? even like for siblings as well, it counts mm-hmm. towards that as well. So obviously there were many because of course they're like, okay, if you made it, then we want your family to make it. So exactly. Like, oh, so like it's a, it's a name because like it's, if one of your family's members is like doing really well in the world, mm-hmm. then their name is there. Exactly. Right? They're the alumni of Harvard. Exactly. They want your siblings to come in too now. Right. So it's thing. this. It's it's not just this idea of. Um, how do you put it? It's not just this idea of going to a world class institution, but it's something like it's adding to your family legacy. It's a status, right? Yeah. It's in in a very in a very interesting way of putting it. It's like your heritage. Yeah. You know, it gives you that pata hai me kaun kind of vibe. Exactly. You know? Like, <laughs> do you know who I am? Translation. But uh, before we move on, let's just talk about like what is Ivy League. So Ivy League consists of eight universities. Mm-hmm. So there is Brown College, Columbia University. Uh, sorry, Brown University, my bad. Columbia University, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, and Yale. Yep. And the history is basically like they, the Ivy League was actually just a, a sports league, like a sports conference. Mm-hmm. Like the NCAA, it's a Div 1, mm-hmm. Division 1 conference. Yep. So like they compete with each other and then whoever wins, they play, go on to the state mm-hmm. championships and then so on and so forth. So, and they're all like, they're eight private research universities. And I think seven of them uh, they started around the time of like colonialism, so, yeah. like back when it was New England, eighteen nineteen, eight early eighteen hundreds kind of thing. Yeah, basically. No, maybe even earlier, because seven seventeen seventy six is when they gained independence. So then seven eighteenth century. Yeah, eighteenth century. So like most of these universities open up in like seven of them started before independence of the USA. So they've mm-hmm. been around around for a long, long time, very long time. So of course, with that, like even like just with age, there's a lot of prestige that yeah. comes with it because like we're the longest standing university mm-hmm. we've been here all this time we've been through two world wars and a civil war and all of that and we're still like number one and it's and also with time comes the whole legacy like like you mentioned it's the legacy that comes out of it because all the people who have or a lot of the people and a lot of the you know discoveries per se in the world that have come out are from are mostly from people who have gone to these very well-known like the institutions art, like the the journals and articles that come from these universities hold a lot of weight because of the name because of the name and that goes because okay they have the most strict criteria for selection uh, they only select the cream of the crop so obviously yep. with that there's a there's a domino effect exactly and at the same time like um the alumni will also donate mm-hmm. right there's a lot of endowments that these universities get like there's a yeah. huge pool that allows them to now it's it's not that just these Ivy League universities have are are good, but they have the resources to make themselves better. Yeah. To always get the best professors to do the yeah. best research. And putting the perspective, um, the endowments within the Ivy League 
ranges between i believe 3 billion uh 5 billion for brown university mm-hmm. all the way to 40 billion us dollars for harvard which is the biggest in one of the biggest endowment funds in the world it's almost as big as the bill gates foundation can you imagine 40 billion dollars is your fund right so now now imagine now i i remember there was this comparison statistic that the amount that the university of toronto gets in their endowment fund is how much harvard pulls out of their endowment fund each year yeah right so if you're getting numbers within the billions imagine the ability for you to do that research and ability for you to invest in r&d but the, exactly yeah. the r&d right they get the state of the art technology they mm-hmm. get um like 3D printing te- uh, facilities University yeah. of Toronto has and I imagine what they have think of in fact like yeah Ivy League has eight but there are also a couple other universities that are coming into the picture for example Stanford and MIT mm-hmm. Stanford and MIT have been have been have been coming up we've yeah. got we've got the University of California yeah That's, UCLA the whole exactly yeah right uh you you Berkeley even yeah. Georgia Tech and now even if you look at it there's a lot of colleges that are coming up as well yeah. like I think I believe Williams College Amherst they're coming up too mm-hmm. but at the end of the day like there's no there's no comparison to the ivy league because of how long they've been there the the alumni the donations and their endowment exactly. now how endowments work i think we should explain this is yeah it's basically their fund mm-hmm. and it's like their investment like for example harvard has a uh, has its own company called harvard management company incorporated yeah and it is an it's a non-profit entity so if you invest in it you're tax exempt mm-hmm. right so a lot of people do that a yeah. lot of like alumni invest in it too and how it works so basically they manage about 12,000 funds in a way like they whoever is in charge of that endowment is in charge of basically it's like an asset manager or an investment manager they decide where to invest where to put their money and they're looking for long term perpetual kind of investments mm-hmm. so something that will be there for a long long time and they'll yeah. keep getting it almost like like annuities yeah annuities exactly they they invest in bonds they invest in pension funds they invest in um hedge hedge funds not so much but mutual I, I, funds i think it's it's basically the more long term long holding sort of fixed investment securities yeah. within quotation marks and, or semi fixed yeah and maybe you never know maybe some of them are trying to invest in bitcoin i won't be surprised if mit invested in bitcoin it, it, that's it a different story surprise see yeah. cuz a lot of these endowment funds actually put money behind certain stocks like remember there was a, there was a there was and now we're we're going to speak i'm going to speak from uft because that that's our experience i don't so really know much we went about to. not yeah. know much about harvard but um there was a time where people were complaining about uft investing in fossil fuels mm-hmm. and i think that was a very big thing and a lot of people protested that they want uft to get out of fossil fuels same so thing happened with ivy leaks there were protests on campus mm-hmm. same that thing that they want people to get out of the use of fossil fuels right yeah. and but the but coming back to coming back to to the benefits of an ivy league i think one thing we spoke about the resources that people get but there's also that networking yeah. right ivy leagues ensure that people first of all it's the name that yeah. already gives you the attention in the room right like if you've gone to harvard or if you've gone to cornell or especially, if you've gone to yale especially in south asian communities oh you went to harvard right <laughs> yeah it's the idea is that you become you become the center of attention automatically automatic and right? everyone wants to network to you everyone's a network to you yeah. which in turn actually improves your network because now you are able to play off other people's resources because they believe yeah intrinsically that say you went to harvard yeah. okay now i would want to network with you because i would have been like yo he went to harvard he probably knows someone yeah right he's probably done something yeah. but now you as a harvard graduate will all will know that i'm thinking that yeah so you will try to network with me because you want to see what sort of connections i have yeah right and they are able to you know then identify what connections will give them benefit and what connections are just connections yeah and I'm, there's a huge example i can give you it's an amazing it happened back in the 70s mm-hmm. like 1971 or 1972 so that's when uh, pierre trudeau used to be prime minister of canada mm-hmm. i think he was his first or second stint first stint and um, he was classmates with uh, his highness the aga khan who is the leader of the Ismaili community. Mm-hmm. So around that time is when Idi Amin in Uganda came into power. Yep. And you know what happened there is that he wanted to kick out all the Asians out of the country. I agree, yeah. Yeah, that that so definitely happened. That was a crisis because it was one I mean, of the Idi, biggest mass migrations in in the yeah, in history. So now the, f- the funny story is that the Aga Khan was classmates with Pierre Trudeau in Harvard. 
Yeah. So His Highness basically called him up and asked for a favor that, hey, I have about, I think, 20, about 20,000 people, like 17,000 people I want to bring into the country. And he's like, yeah, bring them in. Yeah. Why? Harvard Connection. Harvard Connection. I mean, yeah, I mean, they are in Obviously, position. They're both in positions of power. They both have influence, but he, that, that wouldn't have been that easy had they not been classmates. Had they not. Exactly. And like, it's like, it goes to show that going to a university of that nature opens your mind to think in that way. Yeah. And it opens right? a lot of doors to you because you meet a lot of powerful people. Exactly. Maybe like you might... F I mean, yeah, there is that issue of, um, you know, the snob mentality. Like, mm -hmm. they are, like, elitist. You can elitist, say a yeah. lot of people, that's one of the biggest criticisms is that you only bring in, like, elite people. But then again, it's because they can afford it. But at the end of the day, if you do end up making it in there, you have access to those people. You have exactly. access to those families. You have, yeah, exactly. You, ha you have that network. You have the ability to make that connection. Yeah. And if, and the thing is, if these universities didn't bring in those type of people, yeah. then you wouldn't have a university that considered it, consider, that it should be considered elitist. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But there's also an interesting stat as mm -hmm. well. I wanted to bring it up. I, th I feel like this might be, this might show that I got the concept a little bit. There was a research that was done and they looked at the median income after 10 years of, after graduation. 10 years yeah. after graduation, they looked at their median income. And they saw that on the median income of someone who graduated from IV mm -hmm. earned about uh, seventy thousand dollars per yeah. year. That's the median income. Yeah. Any other like second tier university, mm -hmm. it was thirty five thousand. Yeah. Thirty five to forty thousand. That's almost that's half. That's half. Like I'm looking at it here. Yeah. Um. Uh. This is this was actually done by the U.S. Department of Education. Mm -hmm. Um. That a study revealed that people who enrolled in a four year program, their average income is about fifty nine thousand. Mm -hmm. But if you went to Harvard or Princeton or Yale, you would be looking at you know top eighties. Yeah. And the reason for that is the entry level. You have a little more pull on the entry level because the big, big four companies, the big, big companies, they, you know how you have on campus, you have like the campus, campus job events. fairs. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Now the, so, I mean, U of T will get gr really good companies. Mm -hmm. A normal like mid-tier university won't get big companies. Yeah, They'll get mid-tier companies. Mm -hmm. So that's where it starts. The, the highest of the highest companies are going to go to the highest of the highest universities. Because they already know that the cream of the crop exists here. Yeah. Now, something more interesting I, I want to tell you. So, if someone who, is, who has the ability and the specifications to be in Ivy League... Mm -hmm doesn't go to Ivy League and goes to the second tier university, he earns the same too. Isn't that Repeat weird? that again. So basically, if someone who has the ability and mm -hmm. the, the requirement, if they fulfill the requirements to go to Ivy League, but yeah. decide not to go yeah. and go to a second tier university, yeah. they will end up being just as successful. That is true. That is true. But it's also a little interesting to say, okay, now the whole hypothesis that we have about having the name Harvard is... You know, like if you have Harvard, you're successful. Mm -hmm. That kind of, it kind of makes it a little like seem untrue. It's a question mark. It's a question mark. It brings a question mark to it. Like maybe, I guess then, like if you, if you think of it from that perspective, mm -hmm. anybody who is anybody can be successful if they put their mind to it. Yeah. Right. So it's not necessary that you go to Harvard or you go to Yale to be able to, the means that you will be successful. But going to these universities maybe gives you a better edge. Yeah. Okay, because maybe you don't have to work as hard or maybe you, already, you can already see that pathway because of the way the university trains you, because of all the campus events that you have, because of mm -hmm. all the people that you will meet. Yeah. The university trains you in a way to be able to achieve that level of success without actually having to, you know, put your mind to it. Mm. Maybe, maybe someone who is... Let's, let's assume that we have Ahmed. Mm. Ahmed went to Yale. Mm. Okay, Ahmed is extremely successful in life. Mm. Okay, let's say uh, James went to a different university. Okay, James went to a second tier university. Mm. James is equally as smart as Ahmed. But for James to be able to reach the success of Ahmed, it took James significantly more time. Yeah. So if Ahmed can reach his level of success at the age of 32, that he wants to achieve. Now, there's no limit to success, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And James did the same thing. Maybe James would reach that level at 40. Yeah. It's not that James isn't capable. It's just that Ahmed had the 
Ahmed went to that university. And he had the resources and networking. Because he had the resources, the networking, and he had the name behind him. Yeah. You're a hiring manager. Assume you're a hiring manager. You again, you have Ahmed's resume. You have James's resume. Ahmed and James have similar experience. Ahmed and James have similar mental capacity. Yeah. Would you pick Ahmed or James? I'll pick Ahmed because of Harvard. You pick Ahmed because of Harvard. Yeah, you want Harvard on your team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Because it's not that it's not that James isn't capable. James may be very capable. Mm. Could even be more capable than Ahmed. Mm. But Ahmed has that exposure. Ahmed has that thinking. Ahmed has that brand name that comes with a Harvard individual because you know that they have done something to be able to achieve that degree. Not only that, uh, I mean, as much as you can see from the numbers, Ivy Leagues are one of the hardest universities in the world to get into. Yep, your the, price ceiling that we just spoke about. Yeah, but at the same time, they're the hardest to stay. Exactly. It, I mean, it's hard enough to get in, but so a little, a little fact, something about me. I, I got an interview with UPenn yeah. for Wharton Business School. Mm-hmm. And that was my early decision. So, you know, you have a higher chance of getting it. So I went for it. And... When I was doing the interview, I asked them about it and they told me that as much as it's hard to get in, it's even harder to stay in. Yeah. Half the people drop out. And even like, even for us, like if you think about it, um, a lot of people after first year at U of T do end up changing their majors or do end yeah. up dropping out or do end up having to stay at school for a significantly longer period of time. Because it may not be as hard to get in, but yeah. it is significantly harder to stay in that because you have so much pressure. You have so much, you need to do so much mental, mental work. Competitive. Right, because University of Toronto has, I think, upwards of twenty to thirty percent acceptance rate. Yep, they accept a lot of people. They accept a lot of people, and they have a fifty percent dropout rate at the end of first or second year. Exactly, which means that that twenty percent they accepted in that first year cohort is basically a ten percent acceptance rate. Yeah, and I mean, what is like, what does that mean? Is it like a way for a cash grab for the university? Because at the end, these are private universities. They are. They may say that they're nonprofit. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, they have high costs. University of Toronto, similar to Ivy Leagues, is a research university. It is a research university. So maybe that's their way of their day to days. But maybe, maybe that's maybe maybe okay. That could be from a very that that is from a very um, financial, I guess. Yeah, that sort of perspective. But give, let's let's look at it from a more egalitarian perspective. Them uh, accepting a lot of people, giving them a chance, just means giving people a chance mm-hmm. to prove themselves. Yeah, right. It could just be that U of T says we'll accept these many people because it allows them the exposure of going to U of T to see if they have a chance to be able to succeed. They have what and it takes. If they don't have what it takes to succeed in what they wanted to do, maybe they realize that that's not what they want to do. They find something else that they're more passionate about, switch to it, and then run with it. That's true. But if you think about it, that sort of happened with me too, right? Like yeah. I went in for computer science and then I said, you know what? I'm not really having fun with this. I'm going to switch to math. Yeah. And I did math and I enjoyed math. Yeah. Like I came, I started doing uh, political science, yeah. double major of political science and economics. And I dropped political science because I felt that wasn't what I wanted to do. Exactly. So yeah, it, it does give you, because like, yeah, U of T has like this pseudo liberal arts kind of situation. Mm-hmm. You apply for a program and you get yeah. in, but then once you're in, you can switch. Yep. Exactly. Which is really cool. It's basically liberal arts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you, you have that option of, of switching, changing, trying new things. Yeah. And Ivy Leaks won't give you the opportunity. You know what's also really funny? That although their acceptance rates vary between 5 for like Harvard to 10% for like Cornell. Mm-hmm. And by the way, since uh, this, like for the class of 2025, mm-hmm. they recorded their all-time lows in acceptance rate. Yeah. But at the same time, they have one of the highest number of applicants in the world. They do. So at that, at that moment, you have to think that maybe it kind of balances it out. Like maybe they are accepting just as many students like any other universities, but yeah. they just get a lot, a lot, a bigger amount of applicants. Like for example, me. Yeah. Like my scores were not, they were almost there. Yeah. And at that point, you're just like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to apply. Like why exactly. not? You know, like you have right. to give that chance, especially like when you're coming from the communities that we come from. Mm-hmm. A lot of parents have their dream to have their child go to Ivy League. Exactly. Just for them, you're like, you know what? I'm going to apply. Regardless of where I am, I'm going to try yeah, and apply. Yeah, 100%. And, and it's, it's, just so, I like, it's just, there's so much competition, right? Because not only do you have those individuals, because you, cause when, you, when, you, when we look at this whole, like the Ivy League thing, you don't just have people coming in from the continental states or Canada even, right? Yeah. You have people coming from all around the world. So you've got such a big, broad pool of talent. You do. How but do you, 
Yeah. How do you standardize everything so that everybody has the same playing field? Right? Because you've got people doing tests from, from India. You've got people going through the Australian education system. You've got people going through the American education system. Right? You've got some people who have the ability to do great in SATs. You've got some people who can't do SATs but are as capable. So what do you look at? Yeah. And right. yeah, they are trying to get out of the SAT era. It's the, it's the, economic of, it's the economics of choice. Who do you yeah. pick? Yeah. It's cause like, because people have noticed the disadvantages of standardized exams but it's mm-hmm. the only way to really measure be able to relative like like compare the, the relative growth the yeah. ability for us to actually you know the ability for us to actually understand who is who and what is what to be able to do any of those things you need to you need to level the playing field exactly right and when you have this sort of competition right like it's this concept it's this concept of ceteris paribus hmm. if everything else is the same and you change one thing mm. what is that one thing that differs between that like in that in like let's it's like it's like it's like when we talk when we talk about demand right you want to change one determinant of demand to see what actually happens to the whole graph yeah it's the same way you've got so many people you have to standardize them standardize each and every person across the whole board yeah so sometimes you have fair judgments sometimes you don't have fair judgments and yeah. it becomes harder and harder with the larger pool like yeah some people just have a bad day and they flunk and they might have three consecutive bad days, three consecutive exams are kaput. Mm-hmm. So it is unfortunate at that point. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, I mean, it's tough. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very hard world to be mm-hmm. trying to get in there. But at the same time, like, yeah, they have a bigger pool of talent. Yeah. But if you still look at the numbers, mm-hmm. about almost half the, the people who get in are upper class white people. That's very true. So at the end, there is still that discrepancy. Like it's still there. Like it's, they have made grounds. They mm-hmm. have tried to increase diversity. Yeah. But it's, if you look in the grand scheme of things, it's very minuscule. Mm-hmm. And it's very unfortunate. So, and I think there was this one, I don't remember the name of it. It was something to do with the quota of international students or yeah. something like that. And people were, re- I, I forgot the name of it. Now, okay. But I'll, it's right up here. Let's, let's. So, but like the point mm-hmm. of that is, they are just, they are bringing in international students based mm-hmm. on a quota. Yeah. Like, okay, we need this many Asian students, this many black students, this many mm-hmm. Hispanic students, we just bring them in. Yeah. So it removes that idea of meritocracy. Mm-hmm. No one, like, they're not being accepted on merit. Yeah. Maybe they are, but to what extent, you know what To I what mean? extent. Right. So then the question, the question really remains is, if you are not picking the cream of the crop, then are you really worth it? Right, yeah. and if you were to do, if you were to increase your diversity, what what output would that give to your university? What benefit does that give? Yeah, right. Does that push your production frontier forward? Now, if you consider if you consider the unit of production frontier as a number of successful people, let's say you actually give a chance to more diverse groups. So let's say that your half your your level of half mm. were to. So what did we say? We said that half of them are 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 white upper class. Mm individuals yeah right say that that number was dropped to to 30 percent and the rest 70 percent are actually diverse just uh, a mix of everyone immigrants or non-white or even white but not americans yeah right um or even lower class americans yeah what do you do then it's like it's like the movie remember goodwill hunting yes but i've not watched it okay so goodwill so goodwill hunting is basically this cleaner who used to read a lot of library books and he was actually he was very smart Mm -hmm. uh and he went to i don't really remember the name of the university but he went to an ivy league university there was a fourier series on the board and he managed to solve the fourier series and then he ended up writing a math paper or two Mm. so the idea behind this is if you were to give more people the chance would that improve your production possibility frontier it might it's it's highly likely especially of in the case for international students mm-hmm. because when they go back to their countries for mm-hmm. example not all of them do some people decide to stay and become americans yeah like in our case we want to become canadians but some of them decide to go back mm-hmm. with that degree they have their opportunities just open up 100 percent, wide open they right? can literally do anything they want they can because of like just the levels of it just the right. difference in levels just knowing that you came from a degree from outside you know that there is 
that you can achieve. Now, the issue with having that model, yes, your production could go higher, mm -hmm. but your costs will also increase. Yep. In the case that not everyone can afford it. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, there was a there was a paper, there was like a like a website article I was reading, and they were saying, is it worth going to Ivy Leagues? Mm -hmm. And they said it depends. It depends if you can afford it, because if you if you're basically spending your life savings to put your child through that school there's a chance you're not going to make that money back in time it's just because first of all yeah it's hard to get in mm. it's hard to stay in mm -hmm. and then once you're out it's going to take a long time to make that money it's a massive investment to a point that you might not make your money back to that extent okay but the question is do people as as parents do people go to ivy do, do people educate their children because they want money back from their children mm. that's that's another they question want, right yeah it's more like they want to give the best opportunity they want to give children. them the best opportunity because yeah. it's not that it's not that parents really want their children to give them the money back or to have a return on investment per se it's more about this whole concept that the that by giving your child the ability to get that level of education you secure their future if you're in a recession Hmm. Would you rather hire a Yale graduate or a University of Washington graduate? Yeah. You'd hire a Yale graduate, yeah. right? So you, by, by sending your kids to that... You're opening their doors. You're, you're opening the doors. You're, in a way, securing their future. Yeah. So if you think of it that way, then that is already the return on investment that you've done, right? It's yeah. like buying a car. Yeah. Say, say today you bought a brand new... Um, BMW M8. Hmm. Okay? Right? The car looks beautiful. Yeah. It's a crazy car. It drives fast. Okay? And every time you sit inside it, there's a smile on your face. Can you put a dollar value on that? Uh, I mean, yeah, but not the smile. You can't put a dollar value on the smile. Yeah. Right? Because nobody, because the, the happiness you get from driving that car, yeah. nobody can give to you. Yeah. Okay. Even though we know that if you bought it brand new, by the time you drive it out of the showroom, it's going to lose twenty percent, and every year it's going to lose a continuous seventy per seventeen percent on that. But your satisfaction of being in that car, being in able to get it exactly in yeah. five years, that car is going to be worth less than half of what it actually is, what what you bought it for. Yeah. But this, but the happiness that you get every single day from driving that car will increase exponentially as you get more and more comfortable with the car and more but and more used to it. If you take out a big loan mm -hmm. and you can't afford it. Right, you can't afford the car, but mm -hmm. you take out a massive loan to buy a car. Let's yeah. say you took out a massive to buy that BMW. Mm -hmm. Let's say in five years, you still haven't paid off that loan. The mm -hmm. interest has gone up. Yes. And the value of that car is less than half. Will you still have that smile on your face? You, you would. Because every time you turned it on and accelerated, you will still feel happy. No matter how many bills but, you have on your head. But it'll be a different reason. You, at this point, you're not happy. You're trying to run, I would say. But like that's getting very philosophical. My point is that a lot of people sacrifice a lot to get yeah. there, right? And as much as we say that you have a better opportunity and this and that, mm -hmm. there's still a chance you can fail. There is still a chance you can fail. And you go through all that and you still don't quite make it. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, it's of course, when you go to an Ivy League, it's a less chance. It's a, it's a, it's a lower chance of that yeah. happening. But yeah. at the same time, it's still a bigger risk you're taking. It's, it's, I guess it's a bigger risk you're taking, but again, with all investments, the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. Yeah. Right? But in a, in a way, it's almost as if by taking this, by, by risking the, the cash for the reward that you will get, which is a very prestigious degree, you're almost reducing the risk of your failure. Yeah. Or the risk of your, I guess, risk of success might be better. Mm. Might be a better way to put it, right? Because if those who go to Ivy Leagues or those who go to top level schools are more likely to succeed than those, or at least who, get a job straight exactly, out the bat, or yeah. than who are not going to those level schools purely because of the education. Now there could be other factors that come into play, which is like the family status, the, uh, the how, your your status, like if you're upper class or you're middle class or you're low class. Yeah. Even if you were low class and you went to a university, even if you're low class and you went to a fancy university, you probably went on a scholarship. Yeah. Unless your parents have really done a lot and saved as much as they can. Yeah. Or you've gotten a student loan. Yeah. You would go on a scholarship and the fact that you have a scholarship 
means that you have exceptional ability. And when job seekers look at that, that, oh, this yeah. person is low class, but he went to Yale or she went to Yale and had a scholarship for the first two years means that this person really has the ability to do yeah. something. And that and is their grades, securing the And their grades should show it too. Exactly. Yeah. But not all, it, not all of them are success stories. That's not what all, it is. I agree. Not all of them yeah. are success stories. You can't always have success stories. Yeah. But exactly. the fact is that going someplace like that does reduce your risk level. But now with the changing perspective of online education and different styles of universities, different techniques of teaching, mm -hmm. and now certifications, colleges, yep. and whatnot, and of course, changing ideologies. Do you think that these Ivy Leagues are going to stay at that spot or will have the same weight as they used to? I, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. It's, it's almost as if... Will the demand for these universities still be there? Yes. Will mm. its supply possibly increase because of the amount of education? Yes. Will the prestige still be there? I believe so. But will the employability of these universities remain? It'll probably decrease because because there are countries that are still there are countries that are developing and reaching that point of level where the education is good in them. Yeah, it's right? just they don't. It's just that Ivy League has such a massive track record of success. Exactly, it's just hard to remove that prestigious level. But I do believe that many universities will are slowly getting into that level. Mm -hmm. And eventually, when they're enough in that level, mm -hmm. they're going to lose their prestige. Maybe, maybe not. Let's, let's, let's look at it this way. How long has Apple been around? It's 90s. 90s. Yeah. Or let's, 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 let's do it slightly differently. Let's, let's try to compare apples with apples. Um, Porsche has been around since when? World, uh, World War II. Yeah. Okay. Even World War, World War II. Let's say World War II. Um, how long has Tesla been around? A few years. A few years. But oof. Porsche is Porsche still. Tesla may have a bigger market cap. Tesla may be more, more known, but let's they're, say. They're also the future. Not, that's, that's, not, that's, that's, not the, that's not the point that I'm trying to make. Hmm. It is possible that they are the future. And it is possible that other, un and if you take it into the, into the idea of universities, it is possible that other universities will also be the future. Hmm. Right? But Porsche is still Porsche no matter what you say. Yeah. And Porsche will remain to be Porsche no matter what you say. But if Porsche does not keep up with times, mm -hmm. it will eventually die off. That is true. Eventually, the they're going to have to move away from fossil fuels, maybe even 50 years from now. But well, they're going to have to. They're going to have to have hybrids. They're going to start having electric cars. They're going to have to follow the same so, model that Tesla made. So Porsche, no. So not, not the, I, okay, I think we're, 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 Diverging from the topic. No, think. No, like let's bring it to universities now. Okay, let's think about. Um, okay, let's say let's pick let's pick a let's pick an Ivy League. Let's pick. A, let's pick Yale. Let's pick Yale. Compared to University of Pune in India. Okay, that university. I, I don't remember the actual name, but there's a very good university in India now. It's it's ranked IIT. In, I think so, but anyways, probably IIT. But like, but anyways, on, let's continue. Let's just, Okay, forget that university. Think of any university. Think of Jomo Kenyatta University in Nairobi, in okay. Kenya. Okay, let's think of that. Versus Yale. Now, let's say in 50 years, Jomo Kenyatta has revolutionized their education system. Mm -hmm. They have had some sort of funding. Mm -hmm. And now they are the best university in East Africa, probably in Africa. Okay, let's say that. Let's say that. Now, with the issues that, Yale, that Ivy Leagues generally have in terms mm -hmm. of diversity, mm -hmm. A lot of African students, yep. maybe even Asian students, yep. would, like be, would prefer to go to Nairobi. Would rather go to Nairobi to Jomo Kenyatta because mm -hmm. they know that they're going to get a better, they're going to get a similar level of quality. Yep. Fast forward about 100 years. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of people graduated from Jomo Kenyatta, yep. became successful. Mm -hmm. And now Jomo Kenyatta has created that same track record that Ivy Leagues have. Sure. But... I'm I'm not I'm not denying that. Yeah. Like I'm 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 agreeing with that. But I'm saying that Ivy League will still remain Ivy League. Now I'm not and the thing the thing about Ivy League is okay, look, they've been around since the eighteenth century. Right? Yeah. They've been there for a very long time and they've seen the world change. Yeah. So they've seen the world change from the eighteenth century to the nineteenth century, nineteenth century to twentieth century, the industrial revolution. They've been through right? it all. And they've the, had to they have had to adapt. Exactly. They yeah. have had to adapt. Yeah. So 
if the if Ivy Leagues will continue to adapt, which all people should hmm. and all institutions should, then there there shouldn't be a reason why the Ivy Leagues will still not be the Ivy Leagues when a hundred years from now. It is possible that the Ivy Leagues could expand. Maybe there's more universities. Yeah. Maybe more universities reach that level of prestige. Maybe one or two drop off. Maybe one or two drop off. Yeah. But Ivy Leagues will still remain to be Ivy Leagues. There will still, I believe, there, because education is a resource that doesn't end. You are learning all your life. Mm. So universities don't just teach you content, but they teach you how to learn. They teach you how to live your life, right? They give you that networking. They give you those skills mm. to be able to succeed. The network will never die in Harvard, especially because of legacy. Exactly. Yeah. So Ivy Leagues will never lose their legacy. Hmm. There will be, I'm, I guarantee you that there are universities out there that, are, that will give you world-class education. Maybe even better than Ivy. Even better than Ivy League. LSE is probably, London School of Economics is probably one of the best econom, economic universities, economics, finance universities in the world. Yeah. And you look at even Oxford College. Oxford and Cambridge. Oxford and Cambridge have been around for so long. Yeah. The same, they're the same level of eliteness right yeah. but they're still that elite and they will continue to be that elite mm. because of how selective they are because of the content the, uh, the the type of people that they put out right mm. the type of people that they put out are the it's like improving the technology that you that you have in the world yeah. right it's like up, everybody is upgrading the more universities you have that are upper class or elite the better the, the better the technology in the world is going to be. Hmm. Okay? But the ones who have always been pushing those boundaries will be, will always remain to be pushing those boundaries. And those people who are doing look, it for so long. And those who, and the people who are willing to push boundaries are going to be ending up in those universities. Exactly. Even right, even right now, it's the same, they still have that same prestige. Yep. So, yeah, you're right. It's going to take a lot to push it off, but I mm -hmm. still believe that it's going to take one change, one revolution, or even one scandal that can change everything. I Just, don't think so. I feel like if, if there is something new that comes up, I don't know what, like, I can't even think of something right now, but like, for an, exa for an example, like, they revolutionize online education of some mm -hmm. sort, and somehow Ivy Leagues cannot keep up. Yeah. Like is is that is there a world where that's I don't possible? think so? I don't think that's a I don't think that's a possibility in the world. I think that if Ivy Leagues are going to be Ivy Leagues, they have to keep up. Yeah. To be able to maintain that prestige, you have to be there. Mm -hmm. You have to be at the front. Yeah. You have to be pushing those boundaries. You that's have to true. be pushing that, that that production frontier. Now, if you look at the if you look at the level of elite education in the world with like a, with like a supply and demand graph. Yeah. Your demand will continue to increase. Yeah. There's more and more people in the world. Yeah. The population is increasing. And they're getting all-time high applicants. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. the supply will also increase. If online education revolu if revolutionizes and becomes a thing, mm -hmm. there, I guarantee you that there will be more supply because these universities will be able to, you know, accept you be more. able to accept more people. Yeah. But still maintain your elite status because... Even though you accept more people, there's still more people coming into the world. So you'll still sort of accept that level of percentage. Yeah. You get what I mean? Yeah. To like sum it all up, we can just look at rankings. Top five in national rankings. All these eight universities are in the top 17 of the US national ran rankings. Yeah. I think in the worldwide rankings, three are in the top 10. Harvard's first, Columbia's seventh, and Princeton's eighth. Yeah, it just goes to show that they still have that prestige. They still have that prestige, and, and I think go. they will continue to maintain that prestige. And they've dominated for years and years. But coming to your point, if they are on top of the revolution, if they are still the ones pushing that production frontier and improving these so-called human technology in the world, yeah, they just keep keep on doing what they've been doing, basically, and just finding new ways to stay ahead. Exactly, and they'll keep doing it. And that will make, and that will still make universities. Ivy League universities, Ivy League universities. Yeah. But yeah, but there are many people like I know, they just, they just don't prefer that because it's just... Some the, people, some people the don't see that attraction. The environment there is very different. It's very cutthroat. It's very cutthroat. I mean, even if you look at UFT, it's yeah. very similar. It is. There are a lot of mental health issues that come mm -hmm. with it, um, especially when it comes to international students. Yeah. Because the bar is set so high and you're all alone. And then if you, and then you know the resources that have been put Mm -hmm. and sacrifice in order for you to get there and then if you fall short it's a big hit for you 
the the, the risk and reward, of course. Risk and reward. And of course, there's also this, there's also the case where a lot of people just prefer small classrooms because mm -hmm. there are some people who go to university to get the name. And there's there some, some people who will go to learn. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, some people go for both. I mean, you want to be in the best and still learn. Of course, that's ideal. But there's just some people who prefer, you know, having that intimate classroom. Connection with that professor. Exactly. Being able to meet them, speak to them, spend time with them, learn from them. It's like, it's like having a team of all-stars and having a team with one star. You can pull, as a university, you can pull all your resources to that one student. Yeah. And then you can get them the best job, which is yeah. possible, right? So yeah, that sums it up for us today. Yes. And hope you guys enjoy it. Next hope week we have guys... a surprise. Yes. Hope you guys are ready for it. <laughs> Thank you yeah, so much for tuning in. And yeah. very excited to see you, see next, you week. next week. Take care.